and he still lived there. And um, the half-sister died in California in 1986, but I am in contact with her daughter, who would be Les's half-sister, half and one of her daughters, hmm. and that's at Hayward, California. Hmm. And um, so that's been quite interesting. Uh, Les I thought it was down by... Uh, this is uh, well no, we that's where we lived on a farm. Number five, uh, part down two. There, but cool. Les came from Fremont Orphanage, and I always assumed that Lucille Stillman, uh, Dad Heisler's sister Marie, was married to Ernest Stillman, Kenny Stillman's parents, yeah. and they adopted a girl from the orphanage, and I always just. Assume why well, I didn't ask questions, I don't know. But I just thought that they probably got Les and Lucille at the same time. But Kenny told me, oh no, he said, I can remember when, when a nurse brought Lucille on the train. And uh, we went to, Kenny and David were small. He said, we went to town to Holbrook to the train and uh, took the nurse and the baby home, and the next day they took the nurse back to the train to go back to Fremont. Okay. Now, I have no idea whether they went to Fremont to pick her out, whether the folks went to Fremont. I have no idea how, how that took place. Now, why didn't I ask questions? <laughs> well. You were so shocked at the news. Well, you didn't but, have time. Mm -hmm. Oh well, I was married. I was their daughter-in-law for a good many years well, before they died. But it was just something. that Les was not interested in finding out. Mm -hmm. He was 11 years old and in country school and did not know that he came from the orphanage. And the kids told him, and he oh. talked about what a traumatic. Oh, that experience was that was. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And so cruel. Mm -hmm. He was not interested in, at all in, mm -hmm. uh, in the research where I was really inquisitive. Oh. <laughs> That's what it takes is an inquisitive. Yeah, they made it hard on him, mm -hmm. didn't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, children mm -hmm. can be very cruel. Yeah. Oh, my. Uh, but it just shows the difference in the court system then and now. They've changed the laws so that um, that won't happen in an adoption now. They, and, uh, but it so happened that in the name change, Sarah Cunningham from Cook was the judge, a lawyer and a judge, and uh, she had had the same experience. Oh. Is that right? Oh, okay. So... That was interesting. Mm -hmm. That really helped, didn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was, it's been an interesting experience doing the tracing. You, you, um, How are they related to Feeney? Excuse me. Um, well, Les's sister Mabel married uh, Leonard Nolte, and Leonard and Mabel's daughter Carlene married Hank Feeney. Okay. That's a, all right. Carlene is a niece. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, Ren and, or no, maybe it was Grace mentioned some things. Uh, in researching the old papers um, in the 1930s, uh, you found a lot of, uh, well, the Beaver City paper especially had a list of what the court cases were, um, who had been um, issued um, marriage licenses, all that sort of thing. And uh, in uh, court cases in the 1930s, you found quite a few um, items about bootlegging and uh, who'd been arrested and <laughs> and uh, what their fine was and how many days they spent in jail and all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Did you find any anybody that we knew? Oh sure, it was all over the county, so you knew some of them. <laughs> the I lie. 
Yeah, uh -huh. I got caught. <laughs> How about Hera Fah? I never saw his name in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> he kept the booze down in that hole. In those pits. Oh, well, he did. Yeah. yeah. That's what that Baxter bring him in the night and, and they didn't load it and put it in those pits and have the car set right over the pit. And then the next night they, they distributed it. I see. <laughs> distributed. Well, that was a good place to hide it. Yeah. Nobody was going to look there. <laughs> okay. Um, I can remember going to Uncle Guy's. They had an apple orchard. Um, went down the lane from the barn down to the creek to the yeah. apple orchard. And I know there was a a press to make they pressed the apples to make wine. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. um, Jake wouldn't like me telling this, but when uh, Jake was little, he was anemic, and Doctor the Doctor Miller was here, and uh, he said, uh, "Give him some." make some home brew and that has yeast in it and uh, give him a little of that to help build up his blood. Well, Dr. or the Methodist minister, and I don't remember who it would have been back in those years, but Grandpa Thomas brought the Methodist minister out to the farm and Jake met him at the car and wanted to know if they would like a, a cup of a glass of homemade beer. <laughs> and did they, did they take him up? On I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those days the Methodist Church was really strict when I was a little kid. Um, Yay, many. <clears throat> Lucetta remembers signing a pledge card. Do you remember signing oh a pledge my card? Gosh, yes. Anna had pledge cards all over oh. the church. I remember. Oh, yeah. I guess I didn't. We went to Sunday school. Um, I think I was two and a half, going on three. We lived in the house uh, with Grandpa McCoy in the house right north of Lammels, um, where crops bought the house then. And then we moved to the farm out four miles north of Henley. And uh, we had Sunday school in the schoolhouse. And um, so I was out of high school when we moved back to town, and I started going to the Methodist church then. But I missed out on the pledge card. Well, I remember that we they did in our church in Wilsonville, but my sister and I were the a little bit young enough that we didn't have to. I guess they didn't. You yeah, know, got to be. A, I don't know what what the age was that they signed pledge cards. Because I don't think I signed anything. I drove a car on this when I was down at Doan going to school. And it had those real bad snowstorms and stuff. And the, like the uh, truck people, they didn't want to bring them out here. So I go over there to Lincoln and they let me get a, a Max truck line. They let me take the car that was to come out here. And I just take all the blankets and stuff on I could and start home. Every town I came to, I I get out and get warmed up again. Every once in a while, I happen to be a little peppermint schnapps with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I sipped on one on the way home, and I was what was left of us in the, in the tree right south of the house. <laughs> Mom got up the next morning and said, "Who put that there?" <laughs> I was in a heck of shape. <laughs> Yeah, those old cars, and back then you didn't have a heater like you have now, did Boy, you? There wasn't a heater. You had to put a heater in after you got it here. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, God. Cold, gee, it was um, You're talking about when you were in college, and that was when we lived on the farm between Western and Tobias. Yeah. Les's folks had moved down there. His sister, Edith, and Francis Rudpath lived down there, and Francis was from that area. And we moved down there for two years and lived on a farm. And I remember Jake and Shirley coming down from college. They weren't married yet. They picked us up and we came home for Thanksgiving and it was one-way traffic on 
Oh, Six okay. and thirty-four. Yes, I know that. Because of the snow, you mean? Yeah, yes. snow was high as with all from just. Yeah. I don't remember how they did that. They must have had people stop at a certain point, and then they went east, they and then yeah. they they did yeah stop at a certain point, and they'd go west. Uh, during the forty-eight blizzard, when mm -hmm. the road was bad, I went through there. Uh, my sister and husband come in at North Platte on a train, and the only way we could get there, we had to go to Holdridge and go around to get up to North Platte. And as we went through these cuts where they took these big uh, snow blowers and made the opening for the traffic to get through, it was one lane traffic, and there would be somebody sitting at each end of the of the hill or area that was drifted shut, and they would. I guess they had radios. I don't know how they knew, uh, but anyway, they'd, they'd sit there for so long, and then they'd let the traffic go through, and they'd they shut them off. Must have had a walkie-talkie or something mm -hmm. that they could. That was in that was in the '48 blizzard. Yeah. I know. I know. We haven't had one of those for a long time. I They're hope we never have. We're going to get another one. This one. <coughs> this one. This one. Yeah. This one. Look at all those fogs we've had. Yeah. That shows you. Huh. Yeah. Well, we had been down to Les's folks, and it was a beautiful fall weather, just really a nice warm day. And uh, they'd gone someplace and got a cook stove for Mom and Dad Heisler and brought it home and put it up. I can remember that it was white. and. Uh, used wood or cobs in it, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Kenny Raisler was working, was helping out, and he and Les started, we, I don't remember whether they went and did chores or what, anyway, we were there overnight, and they went home, it was snowing so hard the next morning, they were able to drive partway, and then they had to walk and follow the fence posts, the, the wire fence, to get to our place. Mm -hmm. And Les said that Kenny, he got so tired, he, he was a kid, and he, he just wanted to lay down, and mm -hmm. he had to keep trotting oh. to go on. November the 18th, 1948, that's when it hit. Yeah. It hit there at our place about 5 o'clock in the morning. And inside of three hours, telephone lines, poles, and everything were laying on the ground. Yeah. It was a heavy, heavy snow, I know that. When it was over, you could walk over the top of the granaries and the, any shed out there, you could walk over the top of it. The wrist was that high. That was fun when you were kids. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. <clears throat> well, I can remember as a kid, we had lots more snow then. And Daddy would scoop from the house to the barn, but you'd have snow up to the eaves of the house. Yep. And it was that way all winter then. Yep. Mm -hmm. You just walked in tunnels. It was like tunnels. Yeah, you see that? That old Oscar Crop Station, I don't, whenever I came home, that was my job to help old Oscar. I'd have to just scoop a one way path so the people could get there to get gas. <laughs> and that got that snow got so darn deep, you could hardly tow it high enough to get it up there. Oh, gosh, it was deep. How would they ever get any into supplying with gas, though, if the roads were so bad? I mean, he had, he had big tanks. Oh. He had an awful big tanks. For even back in those days. Mm hmm. Big ones. I thought I marked something. Oh, yes. Speaking of crop, um, the, the house where the crops lived for so many years, my grandfather, uh, J.O. McCoy, built that, and then his wife died that next <coughs> year, and he sold that to the crops then. But in July 14, 1927, a friendly croquet tournament held in Arapaho where the course is electrically lighted. There were three double entries from each town, Arapaho winning five out of eight matches. 
Players from Elwood were Guy Winger, Arthur Yeoman, Frank Bell, Ed Harm, Harry Grosshart, and John Fitzsimmons. Arapaho was represented by three teams, J.O. McCoy, Bert Van Winkle, A.V. and George Ireland, George Johnson, and W.E. Stevens. <laughs> so, oh, that old Van Winkle is a guy that, you know, I was, quote me, didn't he build that house where uh, Irish Shepherd lived? I don't know. Or he lived there for a while. Could be. I don't know. I don't know who built that. He was the old bachelor who used to sit out in, the, in that front step on the Oscar station. Oh. He would always sit there. Well, you mean besides Uncle Henry across the street? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. He was a landmark, too. He sat out in front of the old GAR hall or whatever it was there. But it'd be uh, Lammels now. Lammels, yeah. Was the G A R D A R? I don't know which one. G A R. G A R. G A R. And they and he always sat there. And he was deaf from the time of the Civil War. This would have been my uh, uh, granddad's sister's husband, Tyler. And their house is one of the old ones here in town. I think it was built in 1893. And. Uh, <coughs> Where mother used to live. Oh. That's the old Tyler house. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. It's New England style with that mansard roof. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, <laughs> uh, Uncle Henry had got too close to a cannon during the Civil War, and so he was deaf the rest of his life. So she always had to write everything to him. And uh, he always sat down there. And when the kids had come by from school, I suppose he did it to you too. He had a cane and he'd grab the kids by an arm or a leg and yeah. and if you'd talk to him a little bit or he just loved kids. Oh, yeah. If you'd talk to him a little bit he'd give you a nickel. I knew he was always he, a soft he touch. Or oh no, he just oh. wanted to be friends. But the kids kind of were scared of him, you know. Yeah. They cross I've seen kids cross the street just to go so they didn't have to oh, no. what, But being my great uncle, I knew he was always good for a nickel. What do you mean? That's where, that's when we went over there. I think we were at a VC Magic. Store. <laughs> oh, he wanted to go by there because then, then you could get him by a root beer. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or something yeah. five for a penny. So you, yeah. you got some of those nickels then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, in March 8, 1928, the case season was officially opened for 1928 by a night session Tuesday evening. The beautiful weather inspired some members to have the ground conditioned, and the year was started out on the plan which proved so popular last summer, playing at night by electric lights, and that were Cal's cars set north of the garage, is yeah. well, behind the... That's where the court was? Yeah. Yeah, it was behind the station there, mm -hmm. as I remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there were more keys at our back door than I ever, than I never did know how many. Oh, really? For all those clubs, they'd open up, and they had never place for it. Everybody's club. Oh, don't you ever touch them during the day. <laughs> okay. Do you uh, guys remember about, uh, I didn't realize until, <clears throat> until I started reading some of Richard Proud stuff, not this book particularly, but talking to Richard, about how good our uh, tennis courts and stuff were here. Oh, yeah. In the early days, we had the best teams in the southwestern part of the state. And these courts were really they won well known. The state. Hmm? They won the state. Yeah. 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 And there oh, were yeah. two courts, weren't there? Mm -hmm. Two of them, hard fat clay courts. The last I was able to. Right there down where, where, really where Carpenter good. lives now. Yeah. Right under the old standby. Yes. Yeah. 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 Lock. yeah, that's where they were. So they were pretty good at that, I think. Yeah, did you ever climb the standpipe, no, Cal? I did. I didn't. Did no. you? No. But my son did. <laughs> I think he was probably the last one. They they were really up in arms about it. They were going to fine him a big amount, but luckily Grandpa Stacy was on the council at that time. And mm -hmm. So they <laughs> looked the other way. Well, they. I think he asked him how many of you have ever done that, and he'd been one that did. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think they they 
made a law that then banning that. <laughs> there were a lot of pranks pulled over the years. I've heard some of the stories. They always tell one about uh, uh, when the trains used to come through here. Well, you can remember that. Well, I can yeah. remember they <clears throat> guys used to, if you wanted to mail something in the afternoon, you'd go down and you could catch the evening mail and get, that's how George lost his foot that time. Yes. And uh, was trying to catch the mail train. And, uh, but I remember Uncle Milt telling him about a time, <laughs> this was before, this was early day streaking, like our guys had in their day. But uh, Dad said, uh, Fred Ware, who was later the pu publisher of the Omaha World Herald, yes. was raised here, and he, <laughs> he was in on it. I don't remember who all the guys were. Anyway, Dad said, they streaked, anyway. Bear stark naked, he said, all of them ran, about 15 of them, and they just went right through the engineer's thing, right through the, the cabin of the engine and out the other side. Oh, God. <laughs> when he got, that when they got stopped. <laughs> I've never heard that story. No. Yeah, it went on. Well, I think my, there wasn't anybody much ordinary than my Uncle Milt. Oh, no. <laughs> My dad's brother, he was a real practical joker. Even as a little kid, I always knew when Uncle Milt was there because everything, you know, like if you'd sit down at the table, your plate might jiggle because he had one of those little, yeah. a little balloon thing underneath the tablecloth and he'd squeeze that. And he, oh, just all kinds of stuff. He always had all the tricks that kids love. I used to get a kid right? his wife. Aunt she Pearl? Always, yeah, she always had that old saw face in the, she knew more stories. Could tell you that. <laughs> you bet. Oh. I always, it was a long time. Oh. I shouldn't tell this story. I was always kind of scared her because the way she always looked like she was so darn serious. She didn't have a serious thought in her mind. And she always, I always thought she was so straight laced. And she yeah. was my mom from my senior year of high school. Yeah. Aunt Pearl was a wonderful person. <laughs> but I always thought she, she never would do anything like that. I heard the story one time. Dad said they went back to Washington, D.C. to visit Uncle Milton and Pearl. So while they were back there, uh, they were going to go out to dinner. And uh, uh, the ladies talked to me into it. They wanted to go see a strip show because they'd never been to one. And so uh, they decided they'd have dinner and they'd take the girls to that because that's what they wanted to see. Dad said, all of a sudden, they got out of the apartment, got it locked, and got down the hall, and Aunt Pearl said, I've got to go back. And she went back, and of course, Uncle Milt followed her right along, and she went in the bedroom, and she squirted on some perfume, and she said, okay, let's go. They got back out in the hall, and <laughs> Dad says, well, what was that for? And she said, well, she said, those whores aren't going to smell any better than I do. <laughs> That's when I knew that Aunt Pearl wasn't quite a straight place to <laughs> That was her attitude. <laughs> I, I used to be kind of afraid of it, I got so that when her eyes hit it, you got any good stories? Why she'd rattle one up, and she could tell you several. <laughs> My uncle laugh. Milt had a black book like that. I don't know what her happened, and all it was was punchlines. <laughs> oh. He knew them all. <laughs> <laughs> he was really a storyteller. <laughs> Even in Washington D.C., <laughs> he could entertain a whole office. I'd go down to the House Office Building with him in the morning in Washington. I, he'd give me a congressional pass, which gave me freedom into anything I wanted to see in Washington. And uh, ride the buses for nothing. I'd go in the morning with him, and then I'd meet back there at 5.30 when the office hours were over. <clears throat> and I'd just have the whole city to myself. Could you imagine a kid at 16 doing that now? Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. I saw, I saw the whole thing. Six <laughs> weeks. Spent a lot of time going everywhere. But it was fun. But he would keep, I would Zero get back Amazon there. Campbell? Oh, yeah. Is in it? Alexandria? Yes. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of wonderful things in that city. If you yeah. <laughs> subways? Did they have subways? No. Not there. It was New York. No, just old subway. Union Station, yeah. No, I've never been in a subway. I have. Have you? It's really scary. Is it? But I don't, I don't I, think I'd like it. Been, yeah. No, I've never I been said, to My daughter and I went and I said, Vicki, are you sure we're supposed to go down that dirty old 
<laughs> she said that yes, mother. Yeah, I didn't. We didn't go there. We went to New York with, when I was a kid, but we uh, four of us girls, and but we didn't go to the subway. Yeah. Well, what haven't we covered? <laughs> well, there have been a lot of fires in this town. Maybe you might make oh, up. tremendous fires. Might mention a few of them. The hotel includes. About everything you can think of ever burned, I think. Well, did they know how that started or anything? Oh, I'm sure yeah. some of them, I don't know. But you know, uh, wiring isn't what it is today, and there weren't codes like we have now, on, and that kind of, it's no wonder. And then the buildings, there wasn't anything, although that says there was a firewall. When they built that Clutes Hotel, they built a firewall or something to keep mm -hmm. that from Spreading to the other businesses, if it would, if anything would burn or come a, into it. Right there, you mean when it'll? Is there on that uh, yes. north side of that yes. building? There is. Yes. Well, it's still there then. Yes, <laughs> From it's still there. Mr. Einstein had it. And um, the first settlements I've discovered from what I've been able to read were out where on that road where uh, Ken Bensel. Dean and Wanda live at oh. North South Road mm -hmm. on the east side of the creek. That's where a lot of the Saudis were, and there was an early school. And Dorothy was teaching a school out there. Oh, really? <clears throat> it's no longer there. It sat out northwest of Dean and Wanda's. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather's sister and husband, I can't think of it right now. Anyway, they had a Saudi out there. I've got a picture of that one. Oh. And. Uh, <clears throat> It was built up and down that road, see, but it, that went down to the river, and then that came across. Do you, have you ever run across, they said somebody, somebody by the name of Arnold, or something, built a bridge over there, and, and they tried to charge everybody. Well, that, the name wasn't Arnold. Though. Was that not, well, not Arnold? They got the wrong name. Yeah, yeah that's the wrong name. I know I have to somebody it. built a bridge. Uh -huh. Something happened to the bridge that they had there that everybody could use. The water washed well, it, washed out. it out. And so this guy thought he'd be able to let him cross and build it and then start to charge people. Charge a quarter for yeah. him to, That's to, a lot of money. Across to come to town and a quarter to go back. Yeah. And right quick they built, fixed the other bridge. <laughs> what, whatever happened, the, the Republican River Bridge, did there, was there a fee to get across there and they boat mm -mm. and stuff? Not during that I the, ever knew. During the flood, the flood, you mean? I don't know. I was wondering about I don't that. Know. I can't remember. I remember Mother always told, I remember going to Beaver City one day, Rodney and I in the back seat, and uh, uh, we were crossing the bridge down there. Do you remember that old bridge before it went out in 35? Yes. Rumble, rumble, rumble. Yes. <coughs> got a steel or iron bridge, you know, but it had a wood floor, and so it banged and rattled whenever you know. And Mother said, get up here and look at this. Your granddad built this bridge. Rodney's little voice in the back says, yeah, but it doesn't sound like he did a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> but it did. It always, you know, for kids, it was scary. Yeah. You know, you, it sounded like you were breaking down. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Some place in this book it tells about that. Uh, only was an old German, and he... I researched, for, it was one of the earlier researches I did, and uh, they lived out on the Sidmeyer, where the Sidmeyer place was. Yeah, did the Amos build that house, or did Sidmeyer's build? Do you, have you ever run across anything? I meant I to ask know. you that. I don't know. That thing, I think, is somewhere in there says that they, the Diamonds had a big house out there, and I wondered if it was the Sidmeyer place. I don't know. I Maybe never connected be. it. Well, anyway, um, I kept asking questions and asking questions. Finally found out they were related to the Bachermans. And I talked to um, um, Mrs. Paul Lising. Um, okay. Annabelle's mother. Yeah. And she was able to tell me that uh, he and two of his children were buried out at St. Matthew, and she knew approximately where and I went out there and and it's a tall stone in the northeast corner of the cemetery and uh, there are three little cement stones down in front 
and on three sides of the big stone, it had the two children, two little girls, I think it was, died of diphtheria uh, within two days, and then he died shortly thereafter. And uh, they're all buried in the same, mm -hmm. but has, it's all printed on a tall mm -hmm. square stone. Mm -hmm. And then there's three little ones down in front. Mm -hmm. That was kind of common in those, I've noticed that in several cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Uh, the wife went to California, and uh, she's buried in California. Why can I think what that man's name is? Here, Kenny. But you were talking to a while back about oh the old the old stores on the on the south side or on the east side of the street, mm -hmm. kind of like old uh, Annie J's, and, mm -hmm. and then they had that uh, what hardware store, wasn't it? Yeah, that was down by the bank. Tomlin built that Thank bank you. where Charlie uh, Patterson. Patterson took over. Yeah. But Tomlin's the one that built that bank building, okay. according to early Arapaho, anyway. And um, there, right next to that was a hardware store. Uh, that's where my uncle Ed, the, the Wagners, when they were here, did you ever remember Ed and Fred Wagner? Yes. Okay, yes. well, Uncle Ed, and they were undertakers, and they had that in the back of that hardware store. Oh, gosh. Before we had a funeral home, Is that you know, and then everybody had the body at your house. When I was a kid, if you had somebody die, you had the body right there at home. There was no yeah. funeral home to okay. put it in, you know. One well, thing I remember about Wagner, the old, uh, I thought it was Fred Wagner, but I'm not. He used to live right there, blocks south of us, of the folks. Yeah. In the house. That's My Fred. Guys, there were lots of parties at night. That was Fred then. Fred. Mm -hmm. And this this old gal that used to live. Uh, Oh, down there south of White. Mm-hmm. He used to come up there at night for those parties. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Never do that. I want to make sure that she went home before it got too light. Oh, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, geez. That was pretty smart for those days, huh? I don't know who lived there. I can't, I can't. He was talking about <laughs> that uh, when somebody died out in the... Uh, then they'd take the house and keep them, then somebody would come in and set up with the, mm -hmm. the body all night. Oh, yeah. And wake. Yeah, and yeah. wake. Yeah, yeah, I then. remember my grandmother uh, was lying in state. Yeah, I've never liked uh, flower carnations too much since it just the smell was overwhelming. Yeah. Uh -huh. When I was a kid, because you always had all that in the house. Yeah. yeah. I never cared much. They'd take all the furniture out of the bedroom and then yeah. just the casket was in there. Yeah, knew where it was. So people could come and pay their respects. Yeah, yeah, it was a whole different ball game. <laughs> who, was, who was the old boy that had the uh, made the saddle shop and stuff like that? Like where Andy J ended up. Mm, I don't remember that name, but I think it tells about it in there, maybe. Mm -hmm. But where uh, seeing this picture, um, where the upward service station where mm -hmm. Bob's businesses now and that base. block mm -hmm. uh, there used to be a house that's it and uh, it was Colvin's and he mm -hmm. was one of the early day the early I think George Colvin was yeah mm -hmm. he helped lay out the town mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, Vera Faye talked about being going to the girl that lived there and they'd roller skate around the block that was a huge house. Hold though. that picture up. I'm going to try to get a picture on that if I can. Sometimes, sometimes you can get a good one. Uh, yeah, the Colvins were here early days. They're, that's why the Colvin edition is named that. that that's why she always left her horse there when yeah. she came to school. Uh, I, of that, wasn't it? Uh, uh huh. I talked to uh, Lorena uh, Ams lived there when she went to high school. Oh. So I was asking her about the house oh just before God. they tore it down. <clears throat> she and somebody else in the head, she said they could cook and everything. They had kind of a little apartment upstairs and that. Mm -hmm. It was a big house. And she said a great big porch. Well, you can see that went pretty much all the way around. Got it. Yeah. So it must have been quite a show place. That's where Hoppy had that old tire hanging yes. from a rope. Oh, gosh, yeah. Swing back and forth, and that's where he threw that bat football through all the time. Oh, my gosh. That's where he practiced. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty interesting.
Well, I can't remember what that man's name was, and I know it's in here if I could find it. Is this a book that's down at the, you can buy them, you can buy them anywhere. Six dollars. Senior Center has them and the museum has them for sale. Uh, the original ones were green and the only difference is just a duplicate except for this on the back where the library is now. It was I've got one there. I've read it, but I just, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, I don't think there's any change between the old ones and the new ones. They no, just had a different cover. Mother printed, as long as Mother was in the business, they were all green. And when they reprinted them, what they went to this. Yeah. Uh, they were reprinted in, 18, in 1985. Uh -huh. What were some of those jokes that, that uh, Ralph and, and Finch and George used to have back? They just made one paper. Oh, my dad? Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to understand the printing business. Well, the <laughs> best one that I ever remember was uh, <clears throat> George Proud was an attorney here. And one night, he had some mail that he needed to get on that mail train that I told you about. Left about 5, 5.30 in the evening, came through. And he went down there to get it. And the process down there, I don't remember how it happened, whether he stumbled or the train started up. But anyway, it ran over his foot to the tune that it was badly enough cut that they had to amputate. And so uh, I don't believe that was the initial one. Might have been. Well, anyway, regardless. Because he had to have two amputations, one up further, I think. Up further after a while. Yeah. But I think this was the first one. Well, my dad means kind of a practical joker. He did this for several of the, I know people have told me stories about him, so. <laughs> anyway, the, the, uh, he, he uh, waited till the night that he was press night, which was usually Wednesday night because the paper came out on Thursday. Still does, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe it Tuesday, whatever. Well, yeah, yeah whatever. Well, yeah. You can get it anyway, you. press night. And so he'd finish the run, and then he'd pull that uh, on a flatbed press. It prints four pages at a time. And then you cut and fold that. You cut them, and then you folded them. And this is how it works in the printing business. Well, anyway, Dad had stopped the press, and he'd be all done with this run. And then he'd pull one of those pages off. And then on the front, he could insert anything he wanted. Well, he had sat down at the line of type and printed up this story. What it said on the front page was that the local attorney loses uh, foot due to at the at the train station. Although it didn't say anything about a foot, it just says in Dad's headlines. Yeah. I never saw the paper. <laughs> the headlines inferred that this attorney had had to have an amputation, and that Mrs. Proud was very upset. But it never really said what the amputation was. <laughs> it kind of inferred other things, <laughs> and that Mrs. Proud would really miss it. And so anyway, Dad fixed it up and went to the mail and everything, and it went to the house to Florence. <coughs> oh, geez. The next day she sailed into the paper, I guess. Most. And man, did she read my dad to write it, because she thought everybody in town had to, had the same paper. She thought that's what it was. And Dad had the article about him being injured, but he... It didn't have the same wording. Dad had changed all the word. So it was just for there. And he said, I had a terrible time trying to make her understand that everybody in town didn't have that same paper. You know, that it was only one of a kind. And of course, it was, she destroyed it. <laughs> My dad did that to several people. You know, different things that happened to them. And I've had a lot of them come back and tell me later that he pulled that as a joke. <laughs> Something that happened and he'd make a big deal out of it wasn't true. <laughs> Something he loved doing. I found uh, that, uh, who that was, that man's name was Ruley, R-U-E-H-L-E. Really or Ruley? Ruley. Ruley. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It says, uh, in the meantime, there had been serious trouble in the matter of travel and transportation. Roads were mere trails, often paying no attention to the section lines where roads were supposed to be, and so the trail approaching Arapaho from the east took a beeline toward what was known as Arnold's Bridge across Elk Creek. 
John Arnold was one of the earliest homesteaders and owned land on both sides of the creek, so I built a log bridge for his own use, but which the public was allowed to use. After crossing the creek, the trail turned north past his little log house and well thence westward toward town across the homestead of Captain Murphy for a full half mile. Neither Murphy nor Arnold ever thought of charging for the privilege of crossing their land, and Arnold even supplied water for any and all who might desire it and allowed travelers to camp in his grove nearby. There came a time, however, when a heavy rain caused Elk Creek to overflow and Arnold Bridge, overflow the Arnold Bridge, and when the water subsided, it was found that Arnold didn't have any bridge. The situation was really serious as all travel was stopped. Arnold, then in poor health, had quit farming and had no use for a bridge himself, so he couldn't be expected to rebuild his bridge just to accommodate the public. It was useless to ask aid from the county, as the county could only build bridges on established highways, and there was no such highway there. There was another private bridge about a mile upstream owned by a thrifty German farmer named Gruley, which bridge was located at a point where the banks of the creek were much higher than at the Arnold Bridge, and had not been damaged by the high water. Mr. Rooley therefore gladly came to the relief of the situation by informing the public they were welcome to cross his farm and his bridge at 25 cents per vehicle. The community was shocked at this act of what they called greed as such a thing had never been heard of before. It was taking money for nothing. Why couldn't this fellow be decent as John Arnold had been for years and treat his neighbors right? The town people resented the fact that an outsider should be able to levy tribute on all those coming into their city, and they voiced that resentment, but Mr. Rooley didn't care. Not only people coming to Arapahoe, but all those bound for points farther west had to pay him. In fact, travel was quite heavy and business was good. He had struck pay dirt and he intended to make the most of it. The fact that he was making himself the most unpopular man in the community didn't concern him. He was only doing what he had a perfect right to do when nobody could stop him. <laughs> His neighbors, however, were determined to stop him, but the only thing that would do it was a new bridge, and there was no money available to pay for a bridge. They found that Arnold was willing to donate the necessary logs if they would give the work, so they began to organize. They found that by going some distance upstream from the location of the old bridge, they could build where the creek banks were higher, thus lessening the danger from high water. Eventually, a sufficient gang of free workers was organized, and after much work by men and teams, the job was completed. Arapaho again had a free bridge over Elk Creek, and Mr. Rooley's bonanza was ended. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so that's did, part of Did it say about. what year that was? Um, I no. don't know. It doesn't. Uh -uh. I would guess in the 1880s. Probably. From what I know about his stories in there. Uh -huh. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> even if you read the book earlier, it's interesting to go back oh. and read. Oh, yeah. again. You always read find again. something you didn't get the first time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Make yeah. more connections the second time. Mm -hmm. Grace bought a, a Furnace County book that she got over in West John Sale. And I, <laughs> I don't know, but I gave it to Glenn James to read. And I think we got it back. Well, I, don't know. I hope I don't so. Know you gave it. Well, oh, you but, better ask. It might still be over there. Uh, I don't think so. I think somebody bought it when she had the garage sale. Oh, guys. Really? But I don't. Well, you Ooh. better not have done that, Oh, guys. Well, I, I hope they not. was there at the garage sale. I remember them talking about it. Somebody was but talking about it. So. Here oh, really? The James family was clear to, well, like going to Beaver City and running up and down that Beaver Creek thing. They're one of the first settlers over there. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it was really good. About the same, um, approximately the same time that uh, Mr. Burton settled here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, does Kathy have a, have a copy of the Prince County book? I think so. I think it has a lot of information in there, but I don't know what, I really don't know what it all consists of. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. mm -hmm. it's really good. Mm -hmm. The book is about, oh, probably, what, an inch and a half thick? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Genealogy Society were the ones who gathered that material and had it printed. So there would be other copies? There are no other copies. Right. They're all sold. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. 
the the Curtis Publishing Company sold that part of the company that printed that book, and we had the opportunity. We bought some. And then we bought the rest of what they had, but they're all gone. Mm -hmm. We tried on uh, internet to trace, to see if some company had more, but we never found any. I think my aunt, Lila Lang, over Wilsonville has them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that have them. Yeah, there are a lot of them around. But they're, they're no longer available. You can't buy them anymore. I'm not going to sleep all night until I look and see if that book is. <laughs> I didn't know you did that. What? Well, I know I took it over there and I thought he brought it back, right? Well, no, you'll so. probably find it then if he did. <laughs> now she's wondering about me, isn't she? Yes. <laughs> uh, all the talk, all my things. Go look, Grace. We'll let you go I look. Took it to you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody bought one. Was it Jake? They already had one, but they bought one on um, estate somebody's sale. auction, a state sure. sale that didn't sell very high, but lately they have been selling higher. What did mine bring? You remember? I don't remember Grace anymore. I know. Any I mean, she said they had one on the sale. Oh, Do you I remember what they? Oh, I think it was something like seventeen or eighteen dollars that that. That it bought, but that's over several here. years ago. Oh, I mean over there. Oh, oh, you mean over mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. I don't know, and I may be mistaken. It may have been something else. But <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I ruined your day. Well, you, you, <laughs> really, you really got great stir. <laughs> <laughs> you should be the one that stirred. <laughs> oh, oh, the world of hurt. <laughs> oh, you think uh, you have something and it's not where it is. <laughs> oh. Well, we let her go look now so, so yeah. we can see the tirade before we leave. <laughs> <laughs> I remember your brother did that, or your yeah, your brother stayed with me one night to keep Cal from getting after me <laughs> when I bleached my hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jake stayed here most of the night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, got, uh, I've got a book on the 35 flood. Oh, do you? I also have one on the Medicine Creek Dam uh, when they built that. Oh. Um, My brother helped with that, but I don't remember that he had any books, but I didn't get to go to his sale, so it sure could have been on there. Rod, my brother worked for the Bureau for many years. And yeah. He was, well, lived here in Rappel when that was on. He bought that, wouldn't you? Hmm? Polly. Mm -hmm. I believe the co well, contractors is Amos and Lytle. That built that dam. Who? Amos and Lytle. Lytle, yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds right. L I T T E L. Mm hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you'd even remember me. I've often, I can't recall that old guy, that guy's name that worked for the bureau. And he, oh, when did he had a terrific mind on him. Yeah, why did, why did you ask me now? Terrific. Yes. And people think walking down the street, the way he walked, have kind of halfway smile on his face on. They thought he was dumb and why he was the smartest guy ever for brain. Why he remembered everything. What the heck? I don't know. I'll come to you about three o'clock in the morning. I'll sit up in bed. <laughs> you get up and call him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'll marry him. I can see him just plain as day. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that terrible? He used to walk down the street. Yeah. Well, I was going to work. Yes. And why well, he had that kind of ambling walk like he, like you he didn't give a hoop, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one of the bureau men uh, um, was out in Denver, one that was here. Mm -hmm. Of course, Les? Les worked for the bureau. Was that Bucos? Yeah, no. Oh. That wasn't the one that was out there, but okay. uh, one uh, died a year or so ago. And they have a... Mm -hmm. Uh, monthly get together and uh, one of them used to come. Okay, one that the, their children went to school hey, may have been of Spanish descent and they lived. Okay, I think they had a boy and a girl. 
That was the one that was out there anyway. Oh. Mm. We lived down across the, the up. when we lived in the Holloway house, they lived across the street where Wessel lives now. Oh, I don't know where Wessel lives. I guess he moved from down there. Yeah, he used to live next door to the pantry. Yeah, well, he that sold and he moved uh, a block east. No, oh, east. Oh, really? Okay. Wessel moved where now? Well, do you know where Kenny Holloway, where Kenny Holloway used to live? The mm -hmm. house they moved into town. Uh, Heinen's house that burnt, that had the fire in it, yeah. across the street from that. West of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's where. Yeah, that's where I've been taking his yeah. going all the time. <laughs> that's where he taking his vehicles. Yeah. Well, he moved. That from was a little. Oh, what was her name? Heisler. Uh, yeah, Gus and Alpha Heisler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. When she married down, that well, moved down to Plymouth, didn't she? February. To February. An assistant that I can't keep track of all these people. So many new in town. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> tell me, tell me about your visit with uh, Bill yeah, down in February. That was great. Oh, I bet that was something I would I've got, love. I got an hour uh, film on him Have sitting you? there. Yes. Is uh, it all about Arapaho or just the crewmies? Oh no, he told about Arapaho, Wilsonville, Holbrook. The whole area. He's a wealth of information in that man's head. Mm -hmm. And he he's so sharp. His mind is so sharp at 90 years old that he didn't have to stop and think. It was just, and he could name names back years ago up and just the same way today. Yeah. Just unbelievable. Yeah. Some people have it. Wasn't that wonderful? It, it, was, <laughs> it was a wonderful, really a wonderful uh, experience. You've not met him before. Never. No. Oh, yeah, he's quite a fella. We yeah. drove in there in, that, in uh, Fairbury there Sunday morning, and and I didn't know whether to call him or not. I, I, what time was that? About 9, wasn't it? Well, we it was there? about 10 o'clock when we got in the, in the Fairbury. And drove around a little bit, located his place, and decided I'd call. What? Have you got a phone number? That's... Have you got a phone number of him, so... I don't, yeah, I've got his phone number, haven't I? I think so. Yeah, Give think. it to me. Get it for me, will you? Okay, it's at home, but... <laughs> well, uh, Pete's got it, too. Yeah, he does. Oh, Pete, tag my right? Oh, yeah. Does he? Oh, yeah, they talk okay. every Saturday, every Saturday. Oh, do they? Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, gosh. But they, they went down for his 90th birthday open house. Oh, did they? Mm -hmm. He and Pete and Doc and his sisters. Oh, gosh. But he came to the door and he was wearing his pajamas and robe, you know. And he just said, "Oh, well, come on in," and and that's what he wore. Oh, well, he'd all be the time. that way. And yeah. he was just real comfortable, and he mm -hmm. put his hearing aids in and everything, you know. And he was just it real. just was great. I I I don't know when I enjoyed I going to a strange that. place any more than I did right there. Oh yeah, he's that kind of person. Though. You, you just you just felt warm and welcome. That's just yeah. the way you felt. Everybody that meets him says that, you know, that he's so easy to get to know and yeah. oh. know so much stuff. And he just thanked us and thanked us for coming and come Didn't, back again. Haven't you ever noticed in your life, you you know, if you sit down and you think about the number of people that you've met, you know, there are always some that just stand out. Yeah, yeah. always stand out. Oh, yeah. yeah. You want to stand out about then? Well, Mom and Dad. And the boys, every Sunday, they walked to church right by our house. Every Sunday. And you remembered that. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And his dad's name was August, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. August Groovy. And we asked him about his mother, I did, because I was curious about his mother. There was a picture of her right on the coffee table. He said that she had been married, when, or brought to this country when she was 13, mm -hmm. right? And she must have been married shortly after she came to, because he said that she was um, just a child when she had her children, mm -hmm. and that she really wasn't a very kind person. She was, you know, she'd hit the kids and everything because she didn't know how to be a mom. Mm -hmm. Who was that? Oh, she was. Bill, I was Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, him. When they, after they got that house built, they got in, they, at the back door, they just stepped inside and they took their shoes off. And they were dirty at all on the outside. Their clothes came off there too. And before they could go eat supper, they had to go take a shower and clean up. And they weren't allowed in the living room yes. unless there was company. Yes. And he said right. just shortly before she died too that he had visited her and that she served him something to drink and eat, but as soon as he finished with each dish, she took it to the sink and washed it. It was right away, you know. And finished with cleanliness. Yeah. Oh. yeah. That's an illness. Mm -hmm. Gosh, she was probably it. I don't either. <laughs> I can tell you what you could give me one. She, she bought a car when she got up there and there, everything was they had enough, enough money. She bought a car every year. And I never forget yet and bought it. She got those little, those little ten or two door hard jobs. Forty. Mm -hmm. For an old gal like that, you'd never think of. Oh, God. That's what she wanted. Huh? Yeah. And her <laughs> sister, Anna Stegmeyer, never married. And she lived, and we lived, the house that had been moved in from the Dreher place over south of Henry, and we lived in, that Benjamin's later lived in. Uh, Anna lived just to the west of us. And there was a mulberry tree that was on the line. So half of it was on our, <laughs> half on hers. And my kids love to go out there and pick mulberries because she just throw a fit. <laughs> <laughs> Half of it was over on our side. They could pick them. Oh, God. She wanted them all up. Oh, God. And oh. one time, um, Dan and I think it was Pete Life. I'm, I don't remember for sure. Dan and somebody stole one of her watermelons, but it was green. <laughs> <laughs> she knew it was one of our kids. Watermelon stealing used to be pretty popular in the early oh, days around here. I've heard a lot of watermelon stealing stories. <laughs> yeah. I think I only went once, went down to Carskadden. Yeah. And he, he caught us and gave us that. said, don't you guys ever come again. I'll give you all you want. That's what we did. That took away all the fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. You remember, the only story I can remember of uh, Rodney telling one about you guys when you were in the service down at Dome. <laughs> and you had a local bar that you liked to go down and have a beer. Okay, do you remember this? And Rod said that you go down there and he, he couldn't get over that. He, he said there was a fellow there and he said they apparently didn't have any city ordinance but it's children being in the bar or everything. But he said they were in there having a beer one night and uh, this fellow was sitting there and the little kid kept Said, Dad, let's go home. Dad, let's go home. <laughs> tell, tell him Dad that. And Rod said, the guy turned around and says, Oh, shut up and drink your beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every time I think of Don, and, and I remember that bar story. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Vince loved to tell that story. Did he? <laughs> oh, yes. He did. Yeah. <laughs> Place on the Are corner, we still on the... Where they always no, he should think it's like they turned it off. Yeah. Well, I think I better go home and see what my hubby's doing. See if he got his supper. I left it on and he, in the crock pot. He just had to help himself. So. Good night, fun. Thank you, I will. Any yeah. changes? No, he still doesn't have any um, whatsoever. I thought, sure, by the time he got a, off chemo a few weeks, you know, maybe he could get some strength back in. He hasn't. He used to work with him. my husband. Pardon? He used to work with my first husband, Dusty. Bond. Sure. Oh, yeah. And I remember him telling that. I remember Dusty said, that now Weber is a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he thought the same thing about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think they worked well together. Yeah. Yeah. Did you try the end core or anything like that? Huh? Did you drink the end core? You mean Insure? Oh, yeah, Insure. Yeah. Uh, he's done a little bit of that. I've been trying to get him to try at least one of those in the afternoons, you know, see if it boosts anything. Mm -hmm.
but it's really peculiar. You'd be interested in this. He sleeps all night long, you know, have, usually has a good night's rest, and he gets up and he does his breakfast, <clears throat> and he likes to do it himself because he likes it a certain way. So I just put out what he needs and he gets it. And by the time he has that and sits down, <clears throat> eats his breakfast and everything, he's shot again. He used to walk a half mile every morning after breakfast. Mm -hmm. Now he has to sit for a few minutes and then he'll make a trek out to the garage, which is more than what, 60 feet from the yeah. house. And he goes out and he has a chair in there and he sits down there until he's got enough strength to come back to the house. Oh, and by the time he, and then he'll finish his breakfast and then he's ready for bed. He sleeps till 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Tired completely. But it just shoots really him calm, down. Isn't he? he's, yeah, he's, he's, yeah he's he'd really like calm. to go. He, hasn't, he doesn't even want to come to town. Well, he's mm -hmm. getting so emaciated now, he just mm -hmm. doesn't want anybody to see him much. So I can understand oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, folks, I'm getting down to uh, just about the last, my second film. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> I thought you been, were done. <laughs> which is really enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, I would do want to thank each and every one of you for uh, giving us our information, the history of what we've got, and I think it's great. I yeah. really enjoyed this. Oh, that's fine. And, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, <clears throat> but we'll be showing these uh, later on this winter, hopefully. We're at the senior center. Oh, okay. uh, that's the plan right now. But oh, uh, we'll yeah. have to get. I've got to get caught up with them. Yeah. This is uh, this is the tenth or eleventh film of the history of Arapaho that I've got so far. My gosh! Well, you and got something for posterity. So there. that's eleven yeah. hours of it. Yeah. <laughs> but I do want to thank each and every.